Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Stuart. I am Wallace, and I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is February 16th, 1964. It's real meaningful to be here this morning. It's always good to be in an AA meeting, and I really enjoy being in conferences, and I'll thoroughly enjoy this one in about an hour. <laughs> Before I forget, I definitely want to thank Larry and the committee for inviting me to come and share here uh, at this conference. Uh, It was just a few years back I was in Irving, and it's always good to be invited back into the same neighborhood that you've been into before. I have been places and would be thrown out before I stayed very long, so it is good to be here and see some old friends that I have known for many years, and it's good to be making some new friends that I've met this weekend. I'm looking forward to meeting more of you. I am indebted to the committee for having been so nice to me. Uh, it's, It's just great to be accepted and appreciated and loved and to find the kind of love that I felt here especially for the nice room, uh, all of the goodies that are in it. And it, it's just a big place for one man to be living. A uh, great big room, the nicest suite I've ever had at any place I've been, and I really appreciate it. Uh, this morning when I attempted to take a shower a little bit after 5 o'clock, the handle came loose, and I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get a shower. And... Uh, so I took a bird bath. I, <laughs> it didn't bother me too much, but I was fearful that you people might recognize the fact that I hadn't had one. <laughs> but I intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle me. <laughs> I notified the people on the front desk, and they had it repaired about by 9 o'clock, and I did get one before I came down here, and I know y'all are grateful, and I am too. I also want to thank Tim for being my host while I'm here. He's a great guy. He's been real nice, and right after I got here, we had a little meeting in the room and drank coffee and shared, and uh, it was just good to be with him and to be with him uh, frequently during the conference year. The three guys that met me at the airport, uh, I sort of felt like uh, I was in the company of the CID or the CIA. They showed up on a black SUV. One of them had on a white shirt and a black necktie. Two of them got in the back seat and they put me up front. And <laughs> I thought, I hope we're going to an AA meeting. <laughs> But it is good to be here. It's always good to be with my people, and AA people have been my people for many, many years now. I've been looking up on the wall here this weekend, noticing that this is the 60th anniversary of the Texas State Convention, and that's something that you people can be real proud of, and the fact that AA has been around here in this state for that long. And I'm grateful for it, too. And I'm also grateful that a while back we had the opportunity to celebrate the 70th anniversary of AA. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that God in his infinite mercy divinely inspired Bill Wilson and those early people to get this program going because they knew that people like me and Tom I and Larry and All of you guys and gals were coming along, and we would need a way and means to do something about our alcoholic problem. And as I look out over this audience this morning, I see the smiling faces, and I know that we are in a program of recovery. We're not the people that we used to be, 
because of God's grace and because he in divinely inspired this program through Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, and they in turn got in touch with others who hammered out this thing on the anvils of the experience down through the years, whereby it works with work if we work it. And those who come in desperately wanting help can find a way of men and means of doing something about their problem. And I'm grateful that we do have Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm also grateful that Warden Clinton Duffy back in 1941 realized that the alcoholic inmate needed a way and means to address his problem because he had provided those inmates with all sorts of recovery programs. And he found out that even though he taught them how to be carpenters, how to be brick masons, how to do other jobs, that when they went out into the community and they had not done anything about the alcoholic problem, he soon found out that they became drunk carpenters, drunk brick masons, and many of them would end up in these institutions again. And then he recognized that AAs in Oakland and in San Francisco were doing something about that problem, and he called those guys in to start the AA group in Central Prison uh, in San Quentin. And I'm grateful for that because it eventually spread into North Carolina. And old Alan Gill back in Raleigh, North Carolina, I'm grateful to him because he started AA in Central Prison in 1951. And eventually a guy came along that was instrumental in the program of recovery in the Department of Correction, and his name was Tom I. And he began working for the Department of Correction years and years ago. Apparently they knew that a guy by the name of Wallace B. and many others would be coming in there who needed a way and means to address their problem. I am an alcoholic, and I ended up in that group, and I found a way of life. And I want to talk briefly about that journey that I went on that carried me to the gates of Central Prison. And I'm certainly not proud of some of the things that I'll share with you, but I will share from the bottom of my heart because the big book tells me that our darkest past is our greatest asset in working with others. And I know that my many, many trips nowadays into the institutions provides me an opportunity to share with those who lost the way just like I did. And I believe with all my heart that if I share with them and work with them, as many, many others in North Carolina are doing, I believe that many, many of those guys will have the same opportunity to address their problem, do something about it, and find the power whereby they can stay out once they get out. But more important than that is that many of them may not ever get out. But I learned in AA, in the walls of the prison unit, that AA was a program that would work behind the walls of any institution and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole when the principles of the program are applied. I became a free man behind the walls of Central Prison. I did not find my program of recovery in the community. I found it through God's grace behind the walls of Central Prison, and I'm grateful for that because it has enabled me to find a joy, a happiness, a way of life that I never, ever dreamed possible. I didn't wake up one morning in Roxburgh, North Carolina, a little small town up on the Virginia border, and decide that someday I wanted to become an alcoholic. Didn't make that decision. I didn't decide when I was 17 years old when I started drinking that I wanted to become an alcoholic. But I made a conscious decision at the age of 17 to take a drink with a few guys who were running around with me because I had an automobile. I enjoyed the new popularity I had. I had grown up not being very popular. I had always been tall and skinny and awkward and unable to participate like I should in football and some of the more uh, vigorous uh, athletic programs, but I was pretty good at golf from the time I was nine years old on. 
but I grew up feeling bad about myself. And at the age of 17, when I began to sip that beer, I didn't like the taste of it. Uh, it made me feel nauseous. I couldn't understand why those guys would want to drink two or three sometimes. And during the next three years, I poured out a lot of good beer. I didn't like the taste of it. And, and couldn't understand why they would want to drink two or three and act silly. And I, I just didn't enjoy it and, and didn't feel the effects of it. But the, all of that changed when I was 20 years old. I had already been in the Army for several months down at Fort Jackson, South Carolina in basic training. I had been transferred to Fort Lee, Virginia. And I came home to Roxburgh, North Carolina on a weekend pass and on a Saturday night out at a round and square dance, a room about half as big as this room here. I was standing at a heater doing what I normally did when I was out in public. I would be watching other people have a good time. They could laugh, talk, dance, socialize, and I would stand back and watch other guys dance with the girls and just have a nice, enjoyable, sociable time. And I couldn't do it because I felt awkward, I felt skinny, I felt out of place, I felt country, I felt uneducated, I was a high school dropout. I just didn't feel good about myself, and I was not an outgoing person by any stretch of the imagination. I'm standing at the heater that night, and I look over toward the door, and I saw uh, something that I was uh, quite shook up with, to be exact. Uh, two humongous protrusions come in that door that night. <laughs> And, and they were attached to a beautiful woman. <laughs> and they came in the door a long time before she did. <laughs> and she bounced all the way across that floor directly to the heater where I was and began talking to me. And I was embarrassed. My buddies were standing over there looking at me giggling. And when she had bounced across that floor toward me, I had recognized her, even though I'd never seen her before in my life. I had recognized her from stories I heard in pool rooms and service stations and bill joints. And she talked with me for a little bit, and some guys really began to giggle. And it wasn't but a little bit. She invited me out to her car. Uh, apparently, there were some wolves in the parking lot. And... She needed protection, and I'm right out of basic training and had on that Army OD uniform and those little pins on the shoulder to make it look better and all of the medals I'd earned that afternoon at the PX. <laughs> so I escorted her out to the car that cold November night, and I vividly remember how that old Chevrolet sputtered when she tried to get it going, and then she turned the radio on and reached way over in front of my knees to turn that heater button on those old cars, and she got it going. And while she was over there, she began to peck on my ear and nudge up against me and trying to get me going. <laughs> and I was restless, ill at ease, and discontent. <laughs> Embarrassed. Embarrassed. Even out there in that parking lot, I was embarrassed about the situation I was caught up in because I had been warned about getting into situations like that. A preacher brother had warned me about being with naughty women. In fact, he had warned me from the time I was six years old, giving me man-to-man -man talks, telling me what I should and should not do, and I recall the last time that he had given me a man-to-man -man talk was when I was behind the barn with him, and I was about 14 years old. And he told me that Sunday morning prior to going back to South Carolina, and he always changed his voice when he talked. And he told me that morning that if I ever drank white whiskey, rum with naughty girls, I played with myself, I'd go to hell. I knew, I knew that Sunday morning I had never been with a naughty girl, 
I never drank any white whiskey, but I was already in trouble. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there in the car that night with that woman, and she's pecking on my ear and whispering sweet things, and I'm restless, ill at ease, and discontent, and country, and backward, and totally unexperienced. My experience with women up until that night was about like being in the Army. I had fired off a few good rounds, but I'd never been in combat. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. But anyway, after she sat there for a little bit and pecked on me, she reached up on the seat and came out with a pint of moonshine whiskey in two cups. And, you know, I thought at first, and she must be mighty thirsty. <laughs> and then she stuck that cup of whiskey out to me, and I ain't never drank no white liquor. And I began to think about the things I'd heard about her in pool rooms and service stations. I began to think about the possibilities of the evening. And then those thoughts about that my brother had brought up occurred to me, and I was fighting between choosing between this and choosing between that. And I leaned toward the wrong decision, probably, because I looked at her and I looked at them, and <laughs> them told me to take a drink. And, and, and I poured it down. And you're talking about a dance here tonight. There was a dance that night. We sat in the car for a while and then went into the dance, and she grabbed me by the hand when that old fiddling guitar and banjo struck up a tune, and we got on the floor, and we began to do and do and promenade. Lemonade. Whatever it was they were doing, we did it. <laughs> doing the bunny hop, I did that. Got carried away. They had to call me down. It just come natural. About 2.30 Sunday morning, I'm back upstairs in the bed at home, the bed I'd slept in for many years prior to going in service. And I'm laying there fighting off sleep. I didn't want to ever go to sleep again. I just wanted to relive everything that had happened Saturday night, thinking about how I had grown up and become a man, thinking about how my preacher brother, mom and dad had lied to me, about white whiskey telling me that it was something that would send me to hell. I had absolutely been in hog heaven on Saturday night and I couldn't hardly wait to get back and get some more of that good stuff, all of it. I thoroughly enjoyed everything that had happened. And I knew that Sunday morning about 2.30 upstairs in that bed that I had found a solution to my problem a magic ingredient that would enable me to be like normal people, to laugh, talk, dance, socialize, and get along, and, and be able to do things that I had never had the courage to do before. And a lot of those things were things against the moral teachers that mom and dad had taught. But with the booze in my system, I have a courage that I had never had. I had the ability to do things I had never done, and did them quite well, I think. <laughs> I know I was doing real well dancing one night until somebody stepped on my hand. And, uh, <laughs> my perception might have been a little bit different from some other people's. I got along real well there for a while, having an awful lot of good times drinking. And I tell you that I know that from the night that I put that booze in my system, I'm not talking about the little beer I sipped from 17 to 20. I'm talking about when the magic took place, when that stuff really hit my guts and came up to my head and made me a different person. I had gotten in the automobile that night, very self-conscious, timid, shy, backwards. I changed in that automobile that night, six foot eight, 268, bigger than Stewart. Became very articulate, knowledgeable, educated, handsome, my teeth straightened out, my hair got curled. I changed. <laughs> 
and I know that from that night on, for a long, long time, I began to drink precisely for the reason that Dr. Silkworth talks about in the big book. That the alcoholic drinks because he likes the effect produced by alcohol. And I definitely liked the transformation that had taken place in me that night over a 20 to 25 minute period. Loved it. And began to pursue that week in and week out. And had lots of good times. It was six weeks before I came to in jail one Monday morning, not knowing why I was there. The previous Sunday afternoon, I had been drinking vodka with some guys, I was told. And I got drunk and left the service station where we were, and I was picked up for drunk and drive. And I came to on Monday morning, supposed to have been back at Fort Lee, Virginia, but I wasn't. It was the first time my father got me out of jail, the first time I was late getting back to Fort Lee, the first time I was in trouble with the officials, the first time I was uh, had to go into the court system. And it was a lot of first in my life, but that definitely became a pattern over the next 10 years. And over the next 10 years, there was many, many different charges of driving under the influence, driving after license, revoke, resisting arrest, striking police officers, and all that sort of stuff. I lost driver's license in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. <laughs> well, I didn't really lose them. I knew where they were. They were in Richmond or either Raleigh or Columbia. I knew where they were, but I didn't have them. But I can tell you that you do not need a driver's license to drive an automobile. I can drive just as good without one as I could with them. <laughs> but they sort of come in handy when you do get stopped. But it don't make a whole lot of difference if you're drunk, though. It still doesn't help to have one. But anyway, that was just a minor problem. And I don't want to go into all those drunks. I don't have time to this morning because I certainly want to talk about recovery. But I can tell you that I quickly trans, my life quickly changed over from, from being a, a weekend drinker to uncontrolled drinking for some reason or other. I don't know if I drank too much too long. I'm not sure that happened. I don't know if it's genetic or what have you. I don't know if mama put me on the potty backwards and caused it or what. But I quickly began having trouble. And uh, I didn't want those things to happen. All I wanted to do was just to drink enough to get to that little euphoric plateau where everything would be just right, and I'd be lovey-dovey and slick-tongued and articulate and handsome and, you know, just be like normal people. Quite often I would pass that before I ever knew I'd been there, and I'd end up getting drunk and I'd end up getting in trouble. And I didn't want to be that way. I had made a conscious decision to drink at 17 with those guys, but I certainly did not make a decision to become an alcoholic. That was not my intentions. It never occurred to me, because I really didn't know what an alcoholic was at that time. I knew what some drunks were, because I had two brothers that would doing quite well in that capacity, real well in that capacity. In fact, only three of us in my family became alcoholic. Out of a family of six boys and six girls, only three of us became alcoholic. And strange to say that only three of us chose to drink. So uh, the others may be psycho or neurotic, but uh, they are not alcoholic. <laughs> but we became alcoholic. And uh, alcoholism caused me a lot of problems, really. Uh, I got out of the Army the first time in 1955, honorably discharged, went back in in 1956, 18 months after I got out. And uh, problems began to occur there. Even though when I went to Korea in 1957, I had made up my mind on a ship en route to Korea that I was tired of all the problems I had picked up over the years in my adult life. And I wanted to do something about them. For some reason, I knew that I got in trouble when I drank. And I swore off. 
in Korea, a five-month period of dryness. When I was going to school at night, I was soldiering and doing the things that I should be doing, working real hard to keep my mind off drinking. And I prospered. I got along real well. I had gone back in with the rank of corporal through the National Guard. And in five months, I was put before the promotion board because I had been soldier of the month five consecutive times and battalion soldier of the month three. And I was promoted to sergeant. And the same Saturday afternoon, I went to the club to buy my friends some drink. It was a club I had not been into before. I hadn't been in any place where there was drinking going on. And I sat in the club that afternoon and watched my friends socialize by drinking and dance with Korean girls. I sat there, and the illness that I know now that I had that day, which I did not know at the time that I had, began to talk to me and tell me that I had been over there five and a half months. I had gotten along well. I had prospered. The people respected me. The Koreans respected me, and I had done such a tremendous job that I owed it to myself to socialize with those guys and have a few drinks. And I had a few drinks and danced with the girls a little bit. And then I really got carried away, apparently, because within two, two and a half hours after taking the first drink, the bouncers in that club threw me out through the screen door. I had become drunk and disorder. That was a Saturday afternoon before dark. Sunday morning, I reached over and got the fifth, did the same thing Monday, knowing that I was going on duty. And it wasn't long before I was getting into trouble in Korea. And that trouble continued all through the next several months that I was in Korea. That trouble continued on up until I was in Port Lee uh, a year or two later. And the trouble was continuing there. You see, I had picked up a new bride in 1956 prior to going back into service. Not because I wanted to get married, but because it was a gentlemanly thing to do in those days under those circumstances. I had gotten married. And I had run back into service running away from problems. Not because I was patriotic. I was running away from the problems I had picked up during the 18 months I'd been out. And I uh, lost jobs, and they'd gone to jail, and lost driver's license, and owed mother money, my father money, and uh, didn't want to be married, and didn't want to be a father, and all of those things was taking place, and that was my patriotism so far as going back into the service was concerned. But uh, when I when I got back from Korea, uh, mom and dad. And this was in August of 1958. Mom and Dad uh, gave me enough money to furnish an apartment. And I was to come home from Fort Lee and be a father to that little girl and a husband to that wife. And I really and truly fell in love with that little girl with all my heart. Beautiful little girl, just like a daddy. And uh, I was come home on weekends, but it only lasted for a few few weekends before I was bringing the booze in and I was bringing the buddies in from Fort Lee because I had never had a living room before. I had always lived with somebody else before, mom and dad, or in service, and I never had a living room or an apartment. And I began to celebrate that with those guys I was bringing home from Fort Lee and wife, number one, got a resentment about it. And then she began to resent the fact that I was irresponsible, that I wasn't buying groceries, that I wasn't paying the oil bill or the light bill or the phone bill. And I walked out of that apartment in January of 59 and went down to the highway hitchhiking back to Fort Lee, Virginia, because I knew I couldn't be a father. I couldn't be a husband. I could not be responsible. I was living to drink and drinking to leave. And I crawled in a Mack truck that night when he stopped to pick me up. I was hitchhiking. And he asked me when I got in the truck, he said, Soldier, why are you crying? And I couldn't tell him why I was crying. But I knew that there was something drastic wrong in my life. 
anybody that was walking out on a beautiful little girl about 14 months, 15 months old, walking out on a wife, knowing that I would never come back to that apartment again, and I never did. Fortunately, the problems began to uh, crop up to a greater extent. Working after duty hours at the NCO club, working after hours as manager of the NCO club swimming pool to get additional money to finance my drinking habit. And, and then with a little additional money, I got what every drunk needs, another car, a Virginia driver's license, illegal. And it wasn't long before I was caught in Richmond, Virginia, drunk and driving and hit and run. And before I could be tried on that, I was caught in Colonial Heights, seven different charges. Driving on the influence after license revoke and all that crap. And the company commander was tired of complaints coming in about me coming into the barracks drunk. He was tired of the mess sergeant complaining that I was coming into the mess hall in the mornings and vomiting in the mess hall. Those guys were not at all like the brave soldiers we have in Iraq today. They couldn't even stand a little puddle of puke. And they were getting fed up with me. And the company commander sent me to see a chaplain who counseled with me, and it didn't work. That chaplain reminded me of my brother, and he talked like my brother, and he didn't do any good. The psychiatrist he sent me to did not help. I didn't like his looks when I walked in. And I would not be truthful to them. And they asked me a lot of stupid questions, which I didn't have the answer to. But anyway, uh, when the company commander had a phone call from their prosecuting attorney, where I had all of these court cases appealed into high court, and the prosecutor told the company commander that in the event I was found guilty on those charges, I'd be pulling some time in Virginia. And the company commander took action first. He took my record for the past two years and put it before 12 officers. And those 12 officers read all of the drunken, insane events that had been going on. And every one of them unanimously agreed that I had become alcoholically unfit for military service. I did no longer look like the guy that had been soldier of the month in Korea for five consecutive times. Not at all. I was not neat. I needed a high cut most of the time. Most of the time, alcohol was on my breath. I no longer could hold my head up and look at people and walk with dignity and respect because I didn't have the respect of anyone. I was in constant humiliation from the time I got up in the morning until I went to bed at night. And I'd walk around holding my head down because I couldn't look up and look at people. And, of course, the prosecutor was right. When I went to court the next day after getting that undesirable discharge, they gave me a 90-day jail sentence, which I did in Petersburg Jail. Got out in 57 days. Got out because my girlfriend was up there to get me out. I had uh, uh, conceded that I'd never live with wife number one anymore. And I had picked up a girlfriend that was a real, well, doll, cracker doll, or whatever. Uh, she was only 19 or 20 years older than I. And uh, she, <laughs> she was out She was out in the parking lot that morning, and two of her children and all of her grandchildren were in the back seat. <laughs> and I went out to the car after she had paid that $575 fine. And when I got out to the car that morning, she, I told Ruth that I'd never go to another jail. And she said, let's drink to it. And I hadn't seen a pint in 57 days. And she handed me a pint of something. And I broke a seal on it and toasted that old Petersburg jail. Pulled on that thing two or three times, and then I handed it to her. And I remember she spit her snuff out and took one. <laughs> And the next morning, Ruth was back up there again to get me out. This time it didn't take $575. It took $18.75. Her brother-in-law and sister had come from D.C. to Petersburg to celebrate Ruth's love of getting out of jail. 
Well, Mac got caught with drunken driving that night, and I was passed out in the back seat, and they locked me. I couldn't even pass out without getting in trouble. <laughs> it seems that little cloud of impending doom just followed me every which way I went. Everywhere I went, there I was. And uh, eventually Mom and Dad found out where I was in Virginia, and they invited me to come home, and I was glad. Uh, after about a year of being up there, I moved back in with Mom and Dad. And this time they said, no drink. And again, I thought to myself, now, since they're not going to allow me to stay here with no drinking, I'll just go ahead and get my life straightened out. I'm going to try one more time. And another five-month period of dryness cropped up. I worked in the mill at night from 11 to 7 in the morning. I stayed around my father's store, stayed with them. I had uh, really and truly by that time determined that I'd never live with uh, wife number one again, and I had divorced her. And they introduced me to a lady that was eight years older than I that mom and dad felt like would be my salvation. She was a nice lady, and she had a nice house, 13 acres of land, nice automobile. And after five months of dryness and going to church with her and staying around the store and staying in her house some with her and taking care of those chores around her home that all good Baptist Sunday school teachers need taken care of, she probably appreciated my efforts and she asked me to marry. And we got married. And three weeks later we went to a dance and I got up and tried to dance sober and I could like a bull elephant in a china shop. Bumping into everything, no rhythm, music didn't sound right, people were laughing at me, making fun of me. I couldn't dance. And a guy that worked in the mill gave me some old granddad while she was in the powder room. And I did dance when my wife got back for two or three numbers. And also that night, when the dance was over, my wife went out of the room crying because they had to wake me up in the back of the room before I passed out. And I put her through a lot of hell for the next year. Many, many times during 1962, I tried to stop drinking and I could. I tried working after hours in the basement building uh, wooden objects and bookcases and so forth, and none of that worked. I tried going with her back to church again, and that didn't work. Nobody had the solution to my problem. They were all pointing a finger at me, but they were not pointing me in the direction to go that would work for me. And what they suggested did not work. And uh, my drinking was getting constantly worse and worse. It was the most important thing in my life. I was living one day at a time back then. If I can get just enough to drink today and get through today, I'll be okay. I'd never heard of AA, but that's what I was living for. After Christmas of 1962, for the next three weeks, was almost complete drunkenness. I, I didn't work but two or three days during the entire time. And on a Friday afternoon, the third week of January, of 62, I got off at 2 o'clock because of inclement weather and began drinking. I don't recall going home Friday night. Don't recall going home Saturday night or Sunday night. I have vague memories of, a few memories of Saturday morning and Sunday afternoon and other than that, the weekend was a blackout because blackouts have been a way of life for me for a long, long time. A long, long time. I had driven my car on occasions from Roxburgh to Fort Lee and put the car in the parking lot and wouldn't remember where I had parked. So blackout, blackouts was not unusual for me at that time. And on, on that Monday morning, after four days and three nights, of drunkenness. My wife was shaking me real hard, asking me was I going to work that morning, and I said yes, and she got me awake. And when I turned to the right that morning to get off my bed, my elbow hit something on the pillow, 
and it was two pints of white whiskey on that pillow. And I sat down and began to drink. And she came in the room late and saw what was going on. And this time she approached me and said some things with more authority than she'd ever used all that year. Telling me basically I was a no good drunk to get out of her heart, out of her life, out of her house forever that we were through. And when she got home that afternoon, she wanted me out. And apparently... Late that morning, I did go to town after going down to the bootleg joint. I was told I learned this from other people. And I went from the bootleg joint uptown, and late that afternoon, I got in trouble. I do recall that when the sheriff testified at a trial, and I don't take step five from up here, but I heard a sheriff testify that he had looked out his window that Monday afternoon about four o'clock and I was on the street drunk and he said he was coming out to arrest me but the telephone rang I said he talked on the phone for about a minute and when he came back to the door to see where I was I was gone and he figured the police had me or would have me in a little bit and since it was extremely cold he forgot about it and I wished a whole lot of times that I had been arrested that Monday afternoon because Offenses were committed that brought about my arrest again the next morning. And I was placed in jail the next morning and no bond was allowed. January 21st of 63. February the 11th, I stood in Superior Court with no defense because of having been on a blackout, not knowing where I'd been, what I had done, or what had happened. The lawyer said he had nothing to do but just stand mute because he couldn't defend me under those circumstances. So we stood mute. And that meant that we had to listen to the evidence, and then the judge would act. And after the judge listened to the evidence, he says, young man, stand. And when I stood up, he told me that for the offenses committed on the statutes of North Carolina, he says, I now hereby sentence you to a period of natural life plus four years of expiration, state penitentiary in law. That was on February the 11th. Two days later, they carried me into the walls of Central Prison, handcuffed and shackled between two other inmates. I was placed in the general population shortly thereafter. Then I had to go before a classification committee. And when I went before that classification committee for job assignment and so forth, those officers looked at my sentence, and they told me that basically, if you don't be a good boy, you'll never get out of here. You'll never get out of here under these circumstances. And I knew that in that short period of time I had been there, I didn't like that place. And I wanted to get out, so I made up my mind I'm going to be a good boy. But within three weeks, those good intentions that I had about being a good boy went by the wayside, just as they had done time after time after time in the community. Good intentions never did accomplish much for me. They went by the wayside because some guys took me into their confidence and introduced me to some things in the prison environment that enabled me to sleep at night. Little bottles of alcohol were being smuggled in out from the hospital into the general population, and I began to take anything I could get my hands on and get high. In June of 63, three things happened. I was fired from a job, but they didn't send me home. Sent me to work in a print shop. Uh, a man broke into my wife's home and assaulted her. And I went to AA. All of those things happened in June of 63. And anyway, to make a long story short, in for the next eight months, I attended the AA meeting. I sat in the back of the room. I didn't participate. I didn't read. I didn't get involved in anything, making coffee, cleaning up, setting up, doing nothing. I just sat in the back of the room. Occasionally I'd go up to the water cooler or something, 
and, and take a pill. I wasn't interested in AA. Uh, AA at that time in Central Prison, as I look back on it now, was not the best group in the world, but it was the only group there. And I did go. I hadn't hit bottom, but on February 16th, 1964, after having been drunk all from Sunday afternoon up until Sunday night, I came to him on cell block that Sunday night, and I'm way up on the fourth floor. I came to that night sometime after 8 o'clock, and I took an inventory of where I stood in life. Here I am in central prison with a sentence of natural life plus 40. No way will I ever get out. I can't get as drunk and stay as drunk for as long as I want to stay drunk because I don't have the money to do it. The availability of supply was limited. It was harder to get than it is in the community. So I couldn't get sober. I couldn't get as drunk as I wanted to. I couldn't get sober because I had no program of recovery. I wasn't in AA, I was around AA. And I can tell you guys that those guys in there who just have the names on a prison roster and attend meetings and don't do, do anything, it's very, very unlikely they'll ever get sober or ever find a way of life. That's the way it was with me. Having my name on a prison roster did not give me sobriety. And, uh, I came to that Monday night, the Sunday night, knowing that I had no future and was unable to tolerate the present and couldn't think about the past because I'd been such a failure. Made up my mind that I was going to jump over the railing that night head first and end my wretched existence. And I took everything I had and stood at the door. And I know that God in his infinite mercy that night prevented me from going over that railing. Because I came to sometime around 9.30 or 9.40 that night. And it was a roll of vomit to the commode. And I was choking and gasping and had my head in the commode. And apparently passed out on the commode because I came too late on and got in my bed. And the next morning when I went out, the guys in the cell block on the right told me that that night I had cried out real loudly, God, if you help me get back to AA, I'll try. See, I had been going for eight months. The following Thursday night, I walked in the doors of AA at Central Prison. I moved from the back of the room up to the front, sat down on the left side of the podium, and that became my seat. Shortly thereafter, after moving into that situation, and I had gone back into that group with a gift, a gift that I had acquired the previous week, and that was a gift of desperation. I desperately wanted to do something. I wanted more than anything else in the world to find relief from the torment that I had been going through for years and years prior to ever being in prison. And I went into that group that night knowing that this was my only hope. The A group was the only treatment for alcoholism in the prison system that I knew anything about. And I went into that A group looking for help, and I found help, and I found that AA is what I need today. Shortly after I went into that group, Tom gave me a copy of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. He told me what I wanted to do with it, what I needed to do with it. And I took it back to my cell block, began to read it, began to study it, and I began to get active in the group began to write letters to free people, inviting them to come in and speak, write them letters of appreciation. And I'd maintain group rosters for the group. And I would do this on Saturday morning. I'd give up my movie time in order to have access to a typewriter. And I would do those things. Got real, real active in the group. And it wasn't many months uh, after I got into the group that... Uh, Tom shut the group down. 
he, we had had a meeting one Sunday night and he had called on several guys to come up and share. And it was just a mockery, really, of AA. The guys did not know what to say, didn't know anything about AA, and he shut the group down. Completely shut it down, no meeting. And then when he shut it down, he began to call five or six of us into a little library room and meet with us. Five or six or seven of us that he felt like had potential or the possibility we really might be interested in AA. And he began to meet with us on a regular basis uh, in that little room and talk with us about an AA group and what an AA group was about. And it wasn't too long before we started a group back with new leadership. And some of us who had never been active in AA before began to get active in that group. And over a period of time, we developed the best institutional group that I've ever been associated with or heard about in any place I've ever been. We went from one meeting a week to three meetings a week. The first two years that I was in AA in Central Prison, even though I was very active, uh, doing clerical work uh, for the group, uh, being active in the meetings and reading and praying and doing all this stuff, the obsession to drink still followed me. It haunted me at times so badly I could hardly take it. And I reach in my back pocket to pull out a grapevine and read it. I go out behind the chapel and pray, or I go work with another inmate because this is what other people had told me to do. And I stayed dry for that two years, real, real active. And eventually I knew that I didn't have the quality of sobriety that other people had who were coming in now, I could see the joy and exuberance that they had about AA, the enthusiasm, and I wanted that. And I asked Tom about what I needed to do to get into that type or that quality of sobriety. He wanted to know what step I was on. I told him I worked one, two, and three, and I've been waiting for God to zap me, and I can tiptoe through the tulips, and he said, it ain't going to happen that way. And I began to do some more reading and follow up on his suggestion. I was searching the fearless moral inventory, taking step five, praying about character defects and shortcomings, making amends and restitution, and basically launching out into a vigor, vigorous program of action which would bring about the psychic change that he talks about in the big book. And I launched out into that vigorous program of action. wasn't too long before I... Uh, I was taking step five with a guy who was a Presbyterian minister with 20 years of sobriety. I asked him to be my sponsor. And I sat down in the prison yard one Sunday afternoon after I had taken step five. And this was two or three months later, or four months later. And I was trying to remember when I'd have a craving, an obsession for drink. And I couldn't think of the day of the week all the month that it had happened. But I knew that it had been when I had that last craving was before I had taken step five. I sat down in the curb of that prison in front of that chapel that Sunday afternoon. Alligator tears rolled down my cheeks because I knew that God had done something for me that I had not been able to do for myself. And that was removed, the obsession, that phenomena of craving, that obsession of the mind, the theology of the body. He removed it from me. And I've read in our big book, and I believe it with all my heart, that I am recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I am recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. But to me, that does not mean that I'm cured of alcoholism. I have to maintain this vigorous program of action. What I have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And I do that by daily prayer and meditation, by continuing to read, by intensive work with other alcoholics. Fulfilling the responsibility and the commitment that I have acquired from these old timers in AA that I was introduced to and who have been so inspirational in my life, that responsibility and commitment to me must be followed up with action.
first and second Wednesday nights of every month. I'm in Marcy Institution with Tom. The third Wednesday night of every month, I'm in Central Prison, my old home group back in Raleigh. The fourth Wednesday night of every month, I'm at the Sanford Correction Center. The fifth, if there is a fifth Wednesday night, I'm at Marson or some other institution, trying to pass on to those guys what was passed on to me years and years ago. I'm involved in my home group in Southern Pines, North Carolina. I live in Sanford, but I drive 32 miles one way to my home group. I've been a member of that group for over seven years. Same home group as Tom. And we have one of the best home groups that I've ever seen in any place I've ever been. We believe in working with the guys in the institutions and the detox units and trying to keep ourselves fit to be of maximum service to God and the people about us, wherever they are. And I believe that by doing that, I will be able to continue Stay in soul. I got out of prison a long time ago. I stayed in 18 years, one month, 26 days, and two hours. I divorced wife number two while I was in prison because she didn't want me going to AA. She felt AA was a cult. I married a lady that I met when I was on home leave and on work release while I was in prison. I met a lady at church that uh, when my sister took me to church, home leave is when a family member can sign you out and take you out into the community. And it's sort of like having a chain gang guard with you when you're on home leave and you've got a relative with you. They sort of watch you. But anyway, I met this lady. We were married three years before I got out of prison. Department of Correction gave us permission to do that. And incidentally, we celebrated 27 years this past May 26. <laughs> the last year that I was in prison, I asked for permission to have a home built. And one of the guards over at the Sanford Correction Center wanted to know what I was going to do with the home. I said, I'm going to live in it someday. But according to the paperwork that I had, I still had a hundred years to go. <laughs> Governor Scott had commuted the natural life down to 60 and 40, and that made a hundred. So uh, anyway, I put in that request to have a home built, and they gave me permission to have that home built last year that I was in prison. I had already been working with the telephone company for several years on work release and paying room and board while I was in prison for a long time. But I did build that home and I paid for that home in 13 years uh, after I got out because I knew where my money was going. I knew where I was last night. I knew who I was with. I knew what I was about in this life. I was trying to be of maximum service to God and my fellow man trying to be sober, trying to be decent, trying to be respectable as a result of working the program. And I'm continuing to work that program on a daily basis, continuing to trust God, clean house, and try and help others. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I owe my life to it. And my schedule today is not always determined by me. I go and go and go. I heard a guy talking out in the lobby this morning. Rick, I believe, was his name. And he says, uh, I can't do everything that Brooks does. And he can outrun me. And Brooks can't do everything his sponsor does because his sponsor outruns him. Talking about Larry. He says, Larry can't do everything that we do uh, because Tom outruns him. And I can't do everything that Tom does. I'll never be that intelligent. Never be able to run the way that he runs and never be able to do the things that he does because he's such a great organizer and he's such a leader that he's able to get people to follow. I have to be wise. I have to work in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in order to stay so. And I love old Tom today because he's a guy that pointed away. He's been my hero, my role model down through the years. 
and I've never ever met a man with more enthusiasm than he has about the program of alcoholics Anonymous. He's not only loved by me, he's loved by thousands and thousands and thousands all over this world. I'll never have that kind of respect. I'll never have that kind of love. But I do have sobriety. I have peace of mind. I have joy. I have contentment in my life. And I haven't been humiliated all day. I've been sober all day. I've been with my people today. And I know where I was last night, who I was with, and what I did. I've made amends and restitution to the best of my ability to those people that I've harmed, except for my daughter. I tried for 10 years after I was out of prison to become a father to that little girl that I walked out on and did everything within my power. And she wouldn't come to see me. She wouldn't call me. She wouldn't write. I'd go to Raleigh and take her out to eat. And she would drink two or three beers every time my wife and I took her out to eat. And she'd look at the watch. She'd be ready to go home. And I finally told her, if you don't come to see me, I'm not coming to see you anymore. It's 42 miles from my house to yours and 42 from yours to mine. Come to see me and I'll come back to see you. She never has come, and I never have gotten in touch, but I've tried. Recently, I felt a need to do that, and I've had a couple of friends who are real good with computers get me lists of people who are named Deborah, and I've called those people, and not a one of them is the Deborah that I want to get in touch with. I don't know what to do, but I would love to get in touch with She's somewhere out there, and I don't know what's going on. A guy told me when Tom and I were speaking up at Billings, Montana, I shared that one night of the meeting. And he said, you not only walked out on her once, you walked out on her twice. And I began to look at it and realize that maybe I was too impatient, maybe I was too intolerant, that I should have given her more time that I might would have had the opportunity to have set things straight with folks. I hope someday, through God's grace and this program, that I will really and truly be able to make amends to her and get our communication to what it should be. I know that I love her, and I love alcoholics and all. And I'm going to keep on trying to get in touch some way, somehow. Today I know that I'm in touch with a high power. Today I know I'm in touch with you people. And I believe as long as I stay in touch with these two things, for another day, I can say so. I love you people. And thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.